Once Upon a Crime, Chapter 10. The sharp, unearthly bark of a dog fox woke her while it was still dark. She sat up, wondering for a moment how on earth she came to be in a barn with a strange young man. As the events of the previous day came back to her, she shifted in her hay bed, a bruised and aching body complaining at the smallest demand made upon it. The prospect of two days' travel in the ruinous gig did nothing to make her feel any better, on top of which she had yet no sensible plan beyond travel east. What then? She would be faced with an impenetrable castle within a cave, inhabited by a lovelorn giant, or she simply to knock on the door, introduce herself, and demand the return of Frau Habsburg's cats. She still did not know why the giant required them. Despite her loathing for the creatures in general, these felines were in particular... I'll try this again. Despite her loathing for the creatures in general, these felines were in particular. They had names. They had a doting owner. It did not sit well with Gretel to think of them badly used. Rowling's reaction suggested the answer to that particular question would not be a cheering one, and there were so many other things as yet cloaked in a fog of mystery. If Muller had been lending money to Herr Hund and then threatening him, had Hund himself killed the man? Or Roland, perhaps? Gretel glanced over to where the youth lay sleeping. It was hard to believe him capable of such a thing, but then his was a desperate situation. And what of Peterston Muller? Was the same killer also responsible for his unpleasant end? Roland stirred in his sleep, muttering Joanna's name piteously. Surely not. And there was still the murder of Beckstein to unravel. Gretel remembered that he had seemed very frightened that night when she bumped into him at the entrance to the Bard Hotel. He clearly knew his life was in danger, and the Petersons were in town. But then so was Roland. No, there had to be another explanation, she decided. She stood up, dusting hay from her clothes and dragging her fingers through her mud-encrusted hair. It was a relief that there was no looking-glass, for she feared her appearance would cause her serious alarm. She reapplied what pins remained among the tangles and helped herself to the last of the pickled eggs. The sounds of her activities roused Roland from his fitful slumbers. "'Is it dawn already?' he asked, rubbing his eyes. "'Not quite, but the sky has cleared a little. I think it best we start out at once.' It is a long journey, Fräulein. Are you sure you wish to undertake it? I have no choice. There is a case to be solved, and there are matters I must prove or disprove if my brother and I to retain our freedom and quite possibly our heads. I do not wish to go, but go I must. The giant is a monstrous creature. Noticing for the first time that there was fear in the young man's eyes, Gretel told him, I do not expect you to accompany me all the way to the castle. It will be sufficient that you transport me close enough that I might walk there. You cannot confront him alone. It is not my intention to confront him at all. Do not concern yourself. I merely wish to point out that I hired you to drive my conveyance, nothing more. You have already done more than I could have asked of you. She paused, then ventured. However, you may wish to consider the possibility that within the giant's castle there lies the answer to your problems. How so? Leaving aside for the moment the matter of your father's gambling, it seems to me that your difficulties are, in fact, of a mundane monetary kind. It strikes me that the giant has not played fair by Joanna by wishing to change the terms of their arrangement and by bullying and frightening her so that she had to flee. Surely a being in possession of such a fortune as his would neither begrudge nor miss some trifling piece of treasure, a piece that could restore the fortunes of the Hund household and allow you to at last marry the poor girl. Hope lit up Roland's face. Is it possible? Do you believe so? Success is not of belief, but of resolve and of action. Are you with me? I am. Yes, I am. Excellent. Then I think it is quite likely that Hair Giant is about to meet his match. They were soon aboard the gig once more. The horse at least was completely refreshed from its feed and night's rest and pranced along in high spirits. Roland, too, seems to have about him a new air of determination. For herself, Gretel would have given a very great deal to be back in her home with a lovely daybed, tucking into a plate of Hans's spicy goulash. It was hard to identify which parts of her bedraggled body were causing her the most pain. She ached from her bumped head to her bruised feet, with everything in between either scratched or chafed or pinched in the most testing of ways. 
Their route necessitated them retracing their steps for an hour along the road towards Gestenstadt. There was a risk they might be spotted and identified, but there was no alternative. Eventually they would meet a junction and turn right toward the distant snowy peaks. They were nearly at this very crossroads when Roland's sharp eyes picked out a small encampment up ahead. Look, Fräulein, I think it is soldiers. Gretel squinted through the slowly lifting gloom. There were about five figures, all sleeping around the smouldering remains of a fire. An old brown mare grazed nearby, and beyond her was a small trap of the sort favoured by families for travelling. Upon it rested the banner of the platoon. No, she whispered, not soldiers, kingsmen, Bardamse kingsmen, and that, she added, pointing to the largest of the dozing bodies, if I am not very much mistaken, is my brother. They must have decided to take him back to Bardamse. To stand trial, do you think? Quite likely. Whatever their intentions, they must be stopped. You wish to rescue your brother? I wish to obtain that trap. Another minute in this cruel gig will kill me. If, by the by, we can also acquire hands, so much the better. Roland gave her a look that suggested he would never truly understand the workings of Gretel's mind. Gretel decided that was exactly the way she liked it. Stay here, she told him. We can't risk the horses talking to each other and giving us away. I'll rouse hands and together we can drag the trap from the camp. Unhitch our horse from this fiendish contraption and watch for my signal. She hurried along the grassy verge and tiptoed through the sleeping kingsman. Empty bottles of Hans's best plum brandy suggested their slumbers would be deep indeed. She reached her brother. His great belly rose and fell with each snoring breath. Gretel gripped his shoulder and shook him gently. His snoring stuttered a little. She shook him again leaned forward and put her mouth close to his ear. Hans, she whispered, wake up. What? What's that? He cried out. Shh. She clamped a hand over his mouth. For pity's sake, keep quiet. His eyes struggled to focus, registering first shock, then surprised, then a sort of muddled happiness. Not a word, Gretel warned. Come on, before the others start to wake. This way. She heaved him to his feet and steered him through the recumbent body still snoozing around the cooling embers of the fire. Hans actually stepped on an outstretched hand of one of the oldest members of the party, but he was so numb either from the damp chill of the night or the effects of Hans's powerful beverage, he did not so much as twitch in his sleep. The trap was of a solid construction but had seen better days. The once cheerful blue paint had begun to peel and there was rust on the wheel bolts. Here, Gretel positioned Hans between the shafts. You pull, I'll push. She trotted around to the rear of the little cart and put her shoulder against the low tailgate. Go on, she urged in a stage whisper. We must get it onto the road. Wouldn't it make more sense to use the horse? asked Hans. I've got a horse. What? Where? Shh, stop asking questions and pull. To the guttural accompaniment of a duet of grunts, they applied all their weight and strength to the task. The cart creaked forwards. Mind that, Kingsman? Even from her awkward position, Gretel could see Hans was about to run somebody over. Left, Hans, steer left, that's it. All at once, the trap began to set up an ear-splitting squeak with each rotation of its wheels. The noise penetrated the som... Not... Som... I can't read it. The, the sleepy brain of the nearest Kingsman, who sat up, arms thrashing, crying out in the damp air. Who's there? Kingsman's business. Halt! Gretel froze mid-shove. Hands remained still as stone between the shafts. Together they formed a curious piece of equestrian statuary, minus the horse. Gretel held her breath, waiting for the shouting to begin, for orders to be given, for swords to be drawn. Nothing. Silence. She dared to peer over at the disturbed kingsman. Though his eyes were open, his consciousness was still held captive by the plum brandy. Wordlessly, he slumped back to the ground. Particularly good vintage, Hans explained. Shut up and pull, Gretel told him. Another minute saw them on the road, where the going was easier and quicker. Gretel waited until she was what she hoped was a safe distance from the camp, before signalling to Roland, who arrived, leading the chestnut horse. Good Lord, said Hans. Young Hund, whatever are you doing here? Never mind that, said Gretel. Here, let's get him hitched up. She offered Roland the traces and collar. We'll have to keep off keep to the grass until we're out of earshot. That's a very fine animal, said Hans. No wonder you didn't want their old brown nag. Gretel put her case into the trap and climbed aboard. 
Borrowing a cart is one thing, she said. People, people get hanged for horse theft in these parts. Oh, borrowing, is it? Hans sounded unconvinced. That's what we're doing then, borrowing. Gretel fixed him with a stern stare. Feel free to remain with your fellow drinkers. I'm sure they'll be glad to share their thoughts on plum brandy hangovers when at last they regain consciousness. Budge up, said Hans, clambering in beside her. The young stallion adjusted his balance to manage the increased weight of the load, staggering slightly as Roland joined the others in the trap. For an awful moment, Gretel worried they would prove too much for the horse, but she had forgotten its steely character and seemingly limitless strength. The animal sank back on its hocks and then bounded forwards, causing its passengers to gasp and clutch onto one another as it took off down the verge at a rolling canter. They travelled in silence at considerable speed until at last they turned off the main Gestenstadt road and headed east. Gretel tapped Roland on the shoulder. All right, let him ease up now. We've a long journey ahead. He reined in the snorting horse so that it settled into a swinging trot. Hans looked at Gretel, eyebrows raised. Well, this is a turn up. You here with young Hunt. You're not eloping, are you? Roland first paled and then turned scarlet. Don't be ridiculous, Hans. There's perfectly sensible explanation, Gretel told him. Aren't you supposed to be at Cousin Brunhilde's? There is no Cousin Brunhilde. No? Why? What happened to her? Nothing. She never existed. Ah. Uh -huh. Hans shook his head. Good job Roland here came along to rescue then. you then. Heaven knows how long you might have been wandering about trying to find someone who didn't exist. Though I have to say, I'd have thought you'd have known if she didn't exist, her being our cousin and all. Gretel felt suddenly very tired. It was not yet time for Elevenses, and already the day had drained her. On the plus side, the little wooden trap, despite its age, was immeasurably more comfortable than the racing gig and she had prevented Hans from being whisked off to Bardemsey and prosecuted on some spurious charge in her absence. And they were now hastening towards the giant's castle. On the minus side, however, things were beginning to stack up worryingly against her. For a start, having Hans on board would undoubtedly slow their progress, and the trio was all too identifiable. On regaining their senses, the Bardemsey kingsmen would not be pleased to find both prisoner and trap missing and would no doubt go to great lengths to retrieve them and take action against the person responsible for their disappearance, i.e. Gretel. Back in Gestenstadt, word would have reached Capitan Strudel of Gretel's flight and Hans's removal, and he would not be taking it well. To have the authorities in two different towns on one's trail was a disquieting thought. Then there was the matter of General von Ferdinand awaiting proof positive of the princess's liaison with Roland. Would he too send men after her? Gretel was confident that if things went well at the giant's castle, Roland would happily drop the princess and return his affections to Joanna, which would certainly please Queen Beatrix. However, there was a phrase in this assumption that struck in, stuck in Gretel's throat, the bit that blithely reply, relied upon all going well at the giant's castle. She had little experience of giants or their castles. In fact, she had no experience of either whatsoever. But her reasoning led her to conclude that if anything was going to go well for anyone in a giant's castle, it would be doing so for the giant and nobody else within several leagues. She sighed, finding her mind coasting as the countryside jogged by. She was too tired and too hungry to think properly. As if things weren't testing enough, she had also noticed a marked drop in the temperature the farther east they travelled. Clearly late spring was a cooler event in these parts, and they had not yet begun the daunting climb into the mountains proper. Already her thin summer clothes felt inadequate. Roland was in shirt sleeves. At least Hans was clothed in his habitual woollen jacket and breeches. But they had neither hat nor rug between them. They were woefully ill-equipped, underfed and without a sensible plan. Gretel felt cross with herself. This was simply not the way to approach the serious and challenging course of action that lay ahead. Steps would have to be taken to improve their chances of success, or things might end very badly for Gretel of Gestenstadt and all who travelled with her. Very badly indeed. Tell me, Roland, she asked, is there an inn of some sort along this route? You must be familiar with the area. There is, Fräulein. It is perhaps three or four, four hours' ride hence, a little way off this road. I met Joanna there once, years ago, in the early days of our arrangement. It is quite hidden away. Excellent. Aim for it. We will not stop until we reach it. 
I say, Gretel, there was a note of panic in Hans's voice. That's a fair bit of travelling without so much as a bite or a sup. Can't be helped. We must put as great a distance as possible between us and any kingsman who come searching. I have a little money left on me. We will be able to obtain a small meal apiece. And an ale or two? Most definitely. Hans brightened and settled into his seat. Indeed, all three of the occupants of the little cart appeared fortified, ready to press on, ignoring hunger, thirst and fatigue, the golden carrot of a warm inn full of food and beer dangling brightly before them. By the time they reached their destination, however, the sharp wind and jarring motion of the trap over so many hard, bumpy miles had bruised and battered their bodies and their resolve, as well as chilled them to the very bone. Having climbed stiffly from the trap, the three stood, puffing like dragons, into the cold afternoon air, taking in the nature of their intended sanctuary. If Gretel had harboured fantasies of a cosy hostelry, perhaps sporting colourful shingles, windows aglow from within, maybe even a cheering window box or two, they were quickly crushed beneath the heavy, hobnailed heel of reality. The inn comprised a wooden building in an advanced state of dilapidation its shipboard skin split and rotting, its sway-back roof apparently on the point of collapse, and at least two windows with nailed-up shutters in place of glass. In front of the inn was a motley assortment of carts and gigs, all of which put their own shabby trap in a very favourable light. Here and there a bony nag or a broken-down cart horse stood listlessly, some tied to a hitching post, others simply too feeble to require any form of restraint. From within came shouts and roars of the variety that could only be brought about by determined, lengthy and serious application to the business of drinking. They sound a merry band, offered Hans, the smell of stale beer reaching his twi twitching nostrils and causing within him a conflict between the need for alcohol and a lifetime's experience of drinkers and inns which told him that this was a place to avoid. The inn is much changed since last I was here, Roland said. It was some years ago. Gretel shrugged. It is this or nothing. At least there is smoke coming from the chimney. I'll take warmth and rowdiness over freezing my ears off any day. Roland, you'd better stay with the horse until I can find out whom you have to bribe to stop him being stolen. Come along, Hans. Let's put your encyclopedic knowledge of such places to good use. <laughs>